furniture, musical instruments, functional art, beautiful decoration. These pieces and others like them are crafted in wood by master woodworkers who live here in Santa Cruz County and on the Central Coast. In this series, we meet some of these craftsmen and explore the paths they took to develop their talents. We will look at examples of their work. We will discover what and who inspired them. Please join us as we enter their workshops and watch them demonstrate the skills and the techniques they use in creating their signature pieces. Hello, I'm Keith Gudger and welcome to Woodworks. Today we're in Santa Cruz getting ready to go on a tree tour with Leslie Keedy, an urban forester with the City of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation Department. Hello Leslie. Hi, good morning. How are you today? I'm doing really good, thank you. So would you tell us a little bit about what we're going to do today? Well, today we have a tour I do every year and there's 26 trees on the tour and uh, folks can take home a pamphlet which actually has pictures of the trees that we're going to see uh, and the names of the trees by common name, genus, species and what family they're in. So it should be pretty interesting. Any chance that we'll learn a little bit about the kind of woodworking that might be done with the trees? Well, at each tree, there's a blurb on each tree, and I think as we pass trees, we can add little excerpts about if they can be a woodworking tree or what types of trees might be common for woodworking. Great. Are we going to get any history of any interesting stories of the trees? Yeah, there's always interesting stories in Santa Cruz, <laughs> and so yes, you will have some little uh, tidbits of history and then maybe little uh, political stories to go with them as well. Um, good morning. My name is Leslie Keedy, and I'm the urban forester for the city. I work out of Parks and Recreation. I've worked for the city um, for almost 12 years now. And uh, my role at the city is to issue the permits for private and public property, I review all the plans that come into the planning department, all the landscape um, plans that are submitted, and uh, then I help Public Works review projects to see how they'll impact trees, what type of plants we should put back after the projects. And uh, this right here is a Canary Island date palm. And you can see that it was probably initially planted as a little date from a bird seed. Or, um, and so what ended up happening is the seed and the plant started to grow near the wall. And then that plant attenuated or stretched itself up towards the light. And then probably about eight years ago, we had a nice crew come in and they actually shaved or skinned the trunk of it, shaped it into that nice little pineapple configuration. And uh, if you keep them clean like this, they don't harbor rats and different animals and critters, uh, but it also has kind of a nice pineapple shape to them. These trees were popularly planted in the 1800s as accent trees at Victorian buildings, so you might see this species of palm, two of them framing the uh, doorways of these old Victorians. You also will see these types of palms and other palms at missions, uh, lots of places and uh, several missions throughout the uh, state. Um, and then palms also, some folks know and some folks don't, they're actually more closely related to grasses than they are trees. They're monocots instead of dicots. And um, the, uh, there's two types of palm tree classifications. You have feather palms, which are the types of fronds that look like feathers. And then uh, fan palms, which are more like these rounder shaped palms, which are the uh, California fan palms. And uh, there's lots of different kinds of fan palms. Uh, this tree is a nice smaller tree. It's in the pea family. And it blooms pretty much maybe two, three times a year. And it's just an exquisite smaller tree. Usually when it's not sunburned and it's really, really happy, you can get very, very long stalks of blossoms. Uh, they call it the crybaby tree in Louisiana because it actually drips nectar from these little uh, flowers. It also, being in the pea family, has a typical pea pod that's kind of long, and that's generally how you can discern your families. This tree I put on the tour, it's a very unique tree. It's one of the few trees that's heavily armored or barbed. Um, in evolution, trees like this grew these types of armor so animals couldn't climb them. The other thing that's very cool about these trees is they have a flower that looks like some kind of a big orchid flower that's just an exquisite blossom. And uh, the Bombaceae is the balsa wood family. So what's kind of interesting about this is you can cut a limb and it's really light. So um, people who make little wooden planes out of balsa wood and things, they could actually most likely use the Seba wood and have a similar um, 
product. Late 80s, mid 90s, someone may know more than me on that, they actually put in all of these jacarandas around the city hall building. And they're native to Mexico. When I first saw this tree, I thought, oh, it's in the pea family. It's got that cute little mimosa kind of leaf to it. Uh, but then when you look at the pods on it, they look like clams. They're um, kind of a bivalve looking structure. So it's actually in the big Noniaceae family and the trumpet flower families. These actually are more adapted to a drier climate. And so the needle on them is actually very tight and thin. They don't collect water like a redwood would and uh, they're called Cryptomeria. They're in the same family as redwoods, which is the Taxodiaceae. So obviously you'll see similarities in the pod and kind of the look of the tree, but um, it's definitely very different and native to the Orient. Um, people that know Cryptomerias always think of the red cedar, which looks similar to this, but it's not as tall and it has, or they call them plume cedars, and they use them in bonsai gardens and they kind of have a puffy reddish sort of look to them. And again, several different cultivated varieties that look a lot different and they're kind of a smaller growing tree. And you can really tell that when a tree's happy and it gets ample moisture and good growing space and people aren't pulling its limbs off, you know, all day long, they actually just look really, really different. So this was planted at the same time as a lot of the cherries on the mall. And this is just a beefy, very happy tree. I invite you to come back in the springtime. I included the little flower, but this tree is just a big pink poof ball in the, in the spring and it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, what's kind of unusual about this tree is it actually has a grafting down here where a section was grafted onto a wild ch uh, cherry or a plum rootstock, and then another graft up here so you end up getting the top of the tree has this amazing flower quality so it has this just funky graft section which actually adds character but it also makes it look a little bit strange uh, so this right here um, it's an angel's trumpet hummingbirds love them um, um, this is actually a double flowering one. Most of the ones that folks see or uh, have in their yards actually don't have this center blossom inside and they're just a kind of maybe a, sh a salmon colored trumpet. Highly poisonous trees. You know, I'll see ladies walking by here and oh, what a pretty flower and you know, giving it to their little kid to chew on and <laughs> the stroller, wait, 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 wait. time out. Uh, so um, they're actually in the solanum family, which is potatoes, tomatoes, all kinds of things that we actually eat, but this has a lot of the toxic chemicals in it. And so uh, you really don't want to mess with it. You know, it used to be before people got into arboriculture and the proper way of tree trimming and the science of uh, how to trim trees properly, people just used to make kind of hat racks out of their trees and they just kind of stump them. And, and then the tree would have these big, huge cuts. It would have to heal and then it would send out all these sucker sprouts. And so when you get under here, you'll see these really strange branch configurations where the tree was originally topped and then it set out some new sucker sprouts. And so you have these really weird masses of wood. So it's kind of nice that the tree actually has an external canopy that hides all of that. Um, this is a really cool tree. It's very rare. When I first learned this tree, it was over in San Jose and I had seen one tree at a school ground and no one knew what it was. They said, well, it looks like an oak tree. And I said, well, yeah, but oak trees have a, a catkin blossom on them. They don't have a flower like this and they have an acorn and uh, this is definitely not an oak. Um, so in looking at it, we, we finally, you know, I got creative and figured out that it's a, a crinodendron uh, and uh, they're native to Chile. Um, they have these little flowers that look like little lily of the valley. So it's, it's just kind of a, some people call them flowering oak because it does look like an oak tree. This right here is a southern magnolia. It is the type of magnolia that were planted in the plantations in the south. Uh, this tree is easily a hundred years old or so. It's probably one of the oldest trees in Santa Cruz. It was very big on that photo in the 40s. Um, it has that typical magnolia pod on it. Uh, magnolia is in its own family, Magnoliaceae. There's some magnolias like the one at City Hall's deciduous. This one's evergreen. It's just an amazing old tree. This is, they're very primitive as far as, um, so in evolution, you have angiosperms, which are your flowering plants, and then you have, or flowering trees, and then you have gymnosperms, which are your conifers. And um, so these are in evolution, very, very primitive angiosperms when they first started uh, evolutionary uh, develop wise getting into flowering um, rather than cones because gymnosperms came first. 
Um, so these, so you either have a, a boy flower and a girl flower on the same tree, which is monaceous, or you have a individual tree that's a girl and an individual tree that's a boy and that's dioecious. These actually, you get a girl and a boy tree. And in here, I can't remember which one is which, but one of them is actually a multi-stem tree. So females are multi-trunked. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. Um, trees, female trees multi-trunk, male trees have more of a standard single stem to them. So in essence, and it's going to take both of those to obviously make the fruit on it. These don't really have a flower that I've ever seen. I've never seen any kind of a fruit. But when you have a healthy one, they're kind of a nice, very nice fall colored small tree. So um, they're just old and this one's been kind of beat up. Um, but the ones down there look a little bit better. This right here is a female ginkgo tree. We were talking about the Katsuras. Ginkgo also, you get a boy tree and you get a girl tree. This is a girl tree and that's a boy tree. So certain times of year, uh, springtime, you'll see little catkins or little boy flowers on this one. And then on this one, you'll start to see the fruit develop. And the fruits look like a green olive. But boy, when they drop, they are the smelliest, stinkiest, most <laughs> rancid smelling fruit on the planet. No. The story behind this tree is there's probably over, they were maybe put in probably 50, 60 years ago by the city as street trees. But at that time, the city didn't really have foresters that thought about this stuff. And they said, oh, ginkgos. And you know, a lot of them were just probably planted with ginkgo pits or seeds. And so over time, people have called and said, I have to remove this tree. It is the, you know, I love it. It's pretty, but come on, you know, um, it's just a really, really smelly thing. So I've given permits in the last 10 years to probably cut down, you know, maybe four or five of them. There's this one left that's a girl, and there's one left over on Washington that's a girl. And fortunately, the one on Washington, the lady says, you know, I just sweep it up. You know, plug my nose, deal with it. I love the tree. So that's a good story. This one will start dropping fruit probably within the next month. And then every patron that goes in to buy a house or <laughs> ends up sitting there and then the schooner realty ladies just say, you know what, we can't have a meeting in here. Your feet absolutely smell. And immediately I get a phone call and I try to have a meeting in here and the tree smells. And so they wanted to cut this tree down. So for the last three years, you know, I told the gal, this is a tool on my tour. I can't, you know, <laughs> this is ethically just not going to work. So I hire Coyote Pressure Wash. They come out, they rattle the bushes, they pressure wash up in the tree and try to knock everything that's going to fall within the next week out. After every rainstorm or windstorm, crew comes out, fixes it all up. I'm constantly chasing after the fruit, so I try and regulate the volume of calls that come in complaining about it. I mean, I totally sympathize with them because these trees do not smell good, but it's a beautiful tree. So, you know, what do you do? You cut the tree down because it smells once a year. <laughs> uh, what's really cool about this tree also is it's in evolution. We were talking about magnolias. This was actually a pre-conifer tree. If you look at the, the leaf on it and hold it up to the light, it looks like needles of a pine that are fused together. So actually these trees developed and then needle trees kind of developed from them, which is really strange because um, this actually is, I believe, a gymnos, I mean an angiosperm. So it was one of the few flowering plants that actually developed before, uh, this is the way I learned it, before the conifers. So this is again, you know, like our magnolia, this is another one of these really old Santa Cruz trees. And so the story behind this one is written down here in 95. It used to have these monstrous limbs, like you could see the diameter of these limbs, and they were spanning all over this parking lot area. And then if you come as we leave and look on this side of the tree, the bark's off the tree. So the tree has some, some, uh, some pathogens and some, some things that are causing it to decline. And so with this bark, there's also decay that's coming, you know, with the decay, the, as the bark falls off, the tree wood decaying a little bit. So long story short, you had some somewhat decayed limbs that were public hazards because people were parking and walking underneath them. So the city council went to bat uh, with their forester at the time to remove this tree. And so it was just this huge political outcry and I believe a platform was put in the tree and it was really, so the city kind of rethought and they brought in some other consultants and they kind of, all the tree people talked about it and they said, well, we can 
pollard it in essence or, or stub it back and then see if it regrows and then we can manage the regrowth on it and in our boriculture that's called a crown restoration process so you actually cut the tree back hard and then you allow these water sprouts that regrow to become your new canopy. Uh, but then you have to do very frequent weight management because real tree limbs are attached to heartwood of the tree and it's all kind of a monolithic or it's all tied together. When you pollard a tree or top the tree and then the sprouts grow from where you cut, all of those branches are only attached below the bark. They're very superficially and weakly attached. They don't go into the tree. And so as they get heavy, they just snap. So on a maintenance schedule, probably every five years or so, we need to trim it. It's been quite a few years since we've done it. We actually will go in, we'll do some weight reduction on these because these are all water sprouts and I want to get to them and lessen the weight on them before we have water sprouts falling in the parking lot. Um, so we'll actually be doing this tree probably this winter after it loses the leaves. I like to do it in the winter so you can really see the structure and you know, okay, we're going to take out these vigorous ones and cut these other ones back and really be thoughtful about the way we shape this tree to manage the weight load. Um, it's, a, it's a black walnut. Um, a lot of the English walnuts that you see are a black walnut with an English walnut rootstock that's on them. Walnut is a, obviously a great carving wood. It's very dark and a beautiful wood. And the other thing is, is um, these trees put out what's called the lilopathic chemicals, which are a growth retardant. And so it's very difficult to grow anything under a walnut. Eucalyptus have a lilopathy. Uh, a lot of native California plants, um, chamise in the desert. Yeah, there's just, they, they, they put out this chemical and it basically retards growth. And then that way all the nutrients and everything becomes the trees instead of what's growing underneath it. So it's another one of these adaptations like the thorns to you know survive. There's there's two different kinds of oaks. You've got your, um, by classification, so to speak, you have your deciduous oaks and you have your evergreen oaks. And this right here is a red oak, um, native to the eastern United States. These trees are fairly young. They get really big. They have beautiful, beautiful red fall color on them. Um, a lot of people confuse them with pin oaks, and the pin oak actually has a, a more deeper serrated leaf on it, um, and the pin oak doesn't get the same color as these. But they're just a real beautiful oak tree. The deciduous oaks are just a really nice type of oak, and again, they have a woodcrafting merit to them as well. So this right here is, um, I'd have to say one of the prettiest trees in Santa Cruz. Um, you know, I'm from Santa Barbara and we have a lot of these subtropicals down there. And so I kind of grew up with these. And I, I just, there's certain eucalyptus. People say, God, I hate eucalyptus. I said, well, you can't hate a genus that has over 300 trees in it. You hate the blue gum eucalyptus that's <laughs> invading your canyons, but you can't stand here and tell me you, you want the city to deregulate eucalyptus. Um, so this one, it's um, just a beautiful tree. It's an orange flowering gum. The ones in Santa Barbara are red flowering gums. They have kind of a darker color. Uh, they also have come in cream color, pink, a real range of blossoms. I had never seen one with this fiery orange intensity. I mean, this is just, it's just a gorgeous tree. I think it was two years ago or so, the city council approved a building to go here. And so this building is gonna be just this monster building that's gonna go from Pacific Avenue all the way to here. And so I wiggled my way into planning and I said, this tree's on my tour. And it's an absolutely <laughs> beautiful tree. And, you know, when the building goes in and you know, things always look a little different on paper, the wall of the building is supposed to be, you know, kind of like maybe eight to 10 feet from the trunk. I put language in there that this tree is to be retained throughout the development so there's a condition of approval in the planning document. The developer is supposed to work with the private arborist and myself to save this tree. Um, it's going to be really interesting though because with a three-story building or whatever it is proposed right next to it, 
maybe if you come in th from this direction, you'll still see a pretty tree. If you're coming from this direction, you'll see a building. <laughs> um, so it'll remain to be seen. Now, fortunately, the recession has not funded this project, and so <laughs> we're just <laughs> I know. So we'll we'll see. Uh, you know, but once that bank loan goes through, we'll just kind of see what ends up happening. So this one is Jubia chiliensis. They actually make wine out of the dates in South America. Unlike the Canary Island palm, this actually, which we actually have to skin the trunk on and shave, this one, the boots or the uh, flower petioles, they actually are self-shedding. So you end up getting them to just strip by themselves and you have this just very smooth kind of an elephant skin looking trunk. Uh, there are these palms definitely in front of Mission Santa Barbara. At probably at least five missions off the top of my head, I would say that they have these jubias. And hopefully over time, we'll have some jubias out at Derby Park. We'll have some over off the levee over at Mimi de Marta, I think it is. Um, so there's a couple of places where we're trying to kind of uh, repopulate with this. The, there's only two in Santa Cruz. There's this one at the mission. And then there's another jubia over on the upper part of Union Street up above the Rincon walkway. And these were, and they're both very old and they're planted with Victorians. In the Aracaria genus, popularly in Santa Cruz, we have these bunya bunyas. And then we'll see star pine, which is Aracaria heterophylla. This is uh, Aracaria bidwillii. And then um, the other one, monkey puzzle, is Aracaria aracana. So um, monkey puzzles are different from these because monkey puzzles have uh, smaller foliage on them. It's more rope-like and it's not quite as sharp. It's more folded, and, but the cones look a lot alike. Again, the fruit really denotes that genus. So um, the pods on monkey puzzles, bunya bunyas, are just these monstrous 15, 20 pound hand grenades. <laughs> They're just, um, and so when they fall, they are really heavy. So that's kind of how they got that goofy name monkey puzzle, is that if they fell out of a tree, they'd puzzle a monkey. Uh, the gal that owns the Bunya Bunya that we'll see as we're winding down the tour calls me, she lives half the time in France, and her tree is over a sidewalk. So she always calls me and says, Leslie, you need to come and cut the cones out of my tree because they're gonna fall and hurt someone on the sidewalk. This right here is a Don Redwood. And uh, it's a meta sequoia, which is um, different from our se sequoia sempervirens. This right here um, goes deciduous, and so it actually looks like a redwood, but in the wintertime, it'll, like the pin oak, it'll hold its leaves and it'll just look brown. It was really kind of amusing because about 10 years ago, City School called me and said, we need a permit to cut down this redwood, it just died. So I go out there and I go, oh my God, it's a dawn redwood, you guys. You know, it's supposed to look that way this time of year. So I end up denied and uh, wait and it'll get a leaf on it in two months. So these, um, there's a handful of them out at Harvey West Park. I'm kind of spotting them in. There's some really nice ones on King Street. They're um, supposed to be no more dawn redwoods in nature as far as what I've been told and that they're just grown horticulturally now. But they're just beautiful, beautiful trees and then they turn yellow so you get this fall color on a conifer. Um, and they're just really, really neat. Very wispy and kind of a nice leaf. Um, they don't get quite as tall, obviously, as our coast redwood, but they still get, you know, 60, 80 feet tall. They're a big, big tree. Then this one right here is called Nisa sylvatica. It's a tupelo gum. Um, I didn't mention it when we were talking about the catsur and the pistache and the liquid amber, but these are another one outstanding fall color. And this one's kind of, kind of interesting because it has like a really cool shape to it. These are American lindens and uh, they're in their own family. Uh, they're very popular in Europe. Lindens are planted a lot. The flowers um, are kind of inconspicuous, but they have a really nice kind of a light sweet smell to them. Uh, basswood is also treasured for uh, wood carving and they make boxes and everything out of that. Um, it's also kind of a light wood. They can make packing crates out of it. You can see that when you top a tree and you don't leave a branch that's large enough to become the new tree top or the dominant uh, branch you're cutting to, you get these very weakly attached sucker sprouts. You can see that they're very superficially attached and so you'll in essence just have to keep kind of whacking these off. Uh, pollarding is different from topping. Pollarding is a way of pruning trees that was 
done in France way back when in the Palace of Versailles you'll see trees that have been pollarded for hundreds and hundreds of years and they have kind of a cool shape to them. So this right here is a Deodor cedar. It, it has a perfect conical shape. They call them California Christmas trees. Um, this is actually a real cedar. Real cedars are in the pine family and they have needles. Incense cedars are actually not a cedar, they're callocedrus, and they don't have needles, they have flat, more, they're in the cypress family. So sempervirens means always green in Latin. Um, these are the tallest trees in the world as far as um, trees growing. You can see the top of it looks like a star, and so this is actually a star pine. The other common name on it is Norfolk Island Pine, and this is another Araucaria, like the Bunya Bunya. Um, this is Araucaria heterophylla, and um, you can just see it just has a, kind of a similar look, but it's very much smaller leaf configuration. But if you had them side by side, you could see kind of how the scales are laid out, that they're def are definitely related. Uh, these star pines, they sell as Christmas trees in pots. You can grow them as a little house plant on the East Coast if you got a lot of light. Um, again, the pod looks a lot like a bunya bunya pod, but it's very much smaller. And, uh, but the trunks look a lot alike too. So they're just also just a very cool, very pretty. This is a single trunk dug fir that we'll see. And then the final tree on the tour is um, actually a multi-stem dug fir. And so we'll see, just like with the Deodor cedars, we'll see kind of what a single trunk dug fir looks like versus one that was damaged when it was little that's now multi-stem. Okay, so we saw the Douglas fir over at the other one, which is your single trunk X current tree. This is another really, really old tree, 100, maybe 200 years old. I'm sure it went in when the church was done and probably someone brought a little sapling out of the Santa Cruz mountains and plunked it in here. Um, you can see it's very different though. It has many, many trunks. Um, church doesn't have a whole lot of money, so at one point, we helped him put some cabling in there. Um, the cables probably need to be adjusted every five to 10 years or so. So that's something that they're gonna have to look towards. Um, again, really, really old tree. They call them dug firs, but it's really not a real fir. These cones, actually, if you look at them, they hang down and real fir cones actually grow up. So this is pseudo, meaning fault, uh, suga which is actually the genus for a different, it's not the genus for fir though, it's kind of strange. But anyway, um, so Doug fir, this is our top building tree. Let's see if I can get this right. Um, growing to 700 years old and 300 feet tall. So not as big as the sequoias, but definitely a really good sized tree. That was a fabulous tour we had today of the trees of Santa Cruz. I want to thank Leslie who uh, came and, and gave us our little tour. And thank you for watching Woodworks and join us again next time.